It's a privilege to introduce Dr. Oral Roberts. I just returned from a trip to Chattanooga, Tennessee. When they found out that I was from Tulsa, Oklahoma, they said, uh, uh-huh, we know Oral Roberts and Eddie Woods and Jesse Trailer and Larry Baker and Greg Davis and Richard Fuquay. So what more can I say than here's Oral. There's something going on I don't know anything about, Brother Bill Sanders. Now just what is this little instrument? That is from some of your admirers. I'll tell you, if I had a golf ball, I would just go right to work. I'll tell you. I can pat, pat, <laughs> putt. <laughs> Bill, I'm not nervous. I can't even talk. <laughs> I, can, I can putt an imaginary ball. Egypt, I can putt a genuine ball tonight. Bill, thank you very much. I don't know where this came from, but it sure feels good. And thank you for introducing me. And I suppose all of you know who that is, Reverend Bill Sanders, here in our city. Do you know Bill? Yeah, give Bill a nice right. hand. Let's all stand together. Will you please reach over and shake hands and say something good is going to happen to you. Can you do that? Something good is going to happen to you. I just have a feeling that Bill Sanders has been watching the Johnny Carson show when I was on the other night. Okay, Bill, for you. Everybody feel good in your soul? Good deal. Sit down and let's go on this, our second lecture of this semester on the course on the Holy Spirit. I believe that most of you who took the course during the fall purchased a copy of my book on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the value of speaking in tongues today. Now, the real textbook that we're using this semester is the Bible, so try to bring your Bible to every session. And there are three chapters in the book of, in the book of First Corinthians that we'll be using uh, this semester more than any other. First Corinthians 12, First Corinthians 13, First Corinthians 14. Although we will be using many scriptures in the New Testament, the book of Acts, and so on, yet those three chapters in First Corinthians are in essence, our textbook. The first part I wish to discuss with you tonight has to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit itself as a personal experience for you, and then the second part has to do with the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues. The difference between speaking in tongues, say, as a result of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your own life and in exercising a gift of tongues. A gift of tongues, we believe, is distinct and different in many ways from one's own personal speaking in tongues as a part of his private devotions to God. The gift of tongues would have to do with the ministry that you would have. That is to say, you would be ministering in behalf of others. In the same way that I'm ministering or teaching today in behalf of others, you would in that moment when you would exercise a gift of tongues, do so in behalf of other people. Precisely in the way that you would if the Holy Spirit were to manifest a gift of healing through you. A gift of healing or charisma, which is the Greek for the word gift, would not be for you, it would be to someone to whom the gift of healing would be given who is ill. A gift of healing is for the sick. It's not the one who is using the gift. God is merely using the person for whom he's manifesting the gift in order to heal some sick person so that the sick person would receive the gift of healing to heal his sickness. A gift of healing is not given, say, 
to a person like myself through whom it may be manifested by the Spirit, I would deliver that gift to someone, say through prayer or a word of faith or in any way God would direct me, the gift of healing itself would go to the sick person and would deal with the person and his illness. And in like manner, a gift of teaching. If one had a gift of teaching, the, the teaching is for the pupil. It's not for the teacher himself. He's merely exercising a gift of teaching or a gift of preaching or a gift of prophecy or a gift of the word of wisdom or a gift of the word of knowledge. That's in behalf of someone who needs that gift. Turn over to Romans chapter 1 and you will see what Paul had in mind concerning any gift. There are several gifts of the Spirit referred to in the New Testament. Specifically, nine gifts are referred to in 1 Corinthians in, in the early part of it and later administration and, and so on. But here we find what the purpose of a gift is. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.11, please say that, Romans 1.11, say it again. This helps you stamp it upon your mind and remember it. He's talking about, I long to see you. He's now talking to the, the Christians in Rome. I long to see you. I want to be there with you, that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. That I may impart some spiritual gift to you. I want you to notice how he's emphasizing this. To the end, you may be established. Now, some might think that Paul is saying, when I get there with you Christians in Rome, I'm going to go around passing out gifts of healing and gifts of miracles and gifts of tongues, so each of you can have your own gift. But that isn't what he's talking about at all. He's longing in his heart to be an instrument of God's Holy Spirit that a need may be met in someone's life. He feels the hurt of the people. Down deep in his own spirit, the Holy Spirit has caused him to hurt with those that hurt, to suffer with those who suffer, to bear through St. Paul. He will deliver that gift to some person who's sick, that the sickness might be healed. Or if it's a gift of tongues, that he might gather up the needs within those Christians which they find themselves unable to express to God. They are inhibited. They're beaten down with their needs and problems, the puzzles and strife of life. They've tried to pray. Somehow intellectually as they pray, they're not able to get through. And now a gift is needed, a charisma a charisma of praying on a deeper wavelength, praying in the Spirit and with the Spirit, which is praying in 14 verses 13 and 14, that Paul talks about praying with the Spirit, with his Spirit, in the Spirit, which is tongues, praying in the Spirit, I'll pray with the Spirit, I'll pray with the understanding also. He's talking about praying two different ways. Praying with his own intellect, his own thoughts, his own language, and then reaching down inside and praying from the inner depths of his Spirit, which is tongues. And then exercising that as a special gift in behalf of people who are trying to pray, or praise God, whichever uh, case it is. And as one exercises a gift of tongues, he simply is doing it in behalf of someone else. He has a ministry gift. He's doing it as a ministry. And therefore, he comes under certain rules and regulations. I want to throw that in as we start. And for the next 30 or 40 minutes, I want to build, first of all, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then upon the gift of tongues. And then we will have a panel. In the book of Acts, there are five examples of uh, being baptized with the Holy Spirit. The second chapter of Acts, please say it. 
The 8th chapter of Acts. The ninth chapter of Acts. The 10th chapter of Acts. And the 19th chapter of Acts. In the 2nd chapter of the book of Acts, this is the first time that the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been given. Jesus has ascended to heaven. He has been reinvested with the riches which he had laid aside in order to, to become a man. He had laid aside his power and glory in order to become a human being. Now he's uh, out of his human body, out of his human limitations, restored to the right hand of the Father, reclothed, repowered, or re-empowered, reinvested. He's now the full, unlimited Christ. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to bring back to the world the full, unlimited Christ. No longer just the man, Son of God, Son of Man, but now the glorified Son of God. And this glorified Son of God had left them a promise that they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And the first time that he did this was in the second chapter of Acts, which was the day of Pentecost. And from that moment on, we have the charismatic age, the age of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and divine love working in human society to meet their needs. It's post-Pentecost when the church or the body of Christ is spreading over the world, when they need the supernatural power of God in their individual members so they can act as an individual under the anointing of the Holy Spirit or they can act collectively as a body, as a group in the world. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's Acts 2.4. That's the first time that this dimension of the Holy Spirit was given. Now notice I said that this is the first time that this dimension of the Holy Spirit was given. I did not say this is the first time the Holy Spirit was ever manifested. For the Holy Spirit has been here from the beginning. When God said, let us make man, the Holy Spirit was there. God, the Holy Spirit, had a part in the creating of the world, the creating of the earth. The Holy Spirit worked throughout the Old Testament in many different ways. You remember in Genesis 6 where God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. That was just before the flood came. We read on many occasions when the Holy Spirit would come upon someone like Samuel or David or Samson, some prophet, or some private individual, a man or a woman, or even a child, the Holy Spirit would come upon him. And the Holy Spirit supernaturally gave Jesus Christ his human birth. The Holy Spirit uh, came upon Jesus Christ in the form of a holy dove lighting upon his head for that moment. He was filled with the Holy Spirit himself and filled without measure or beyond measure. He did all of his works while on earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, I do nothing of myself. And anyone, anyone who wants to live the life of Christ can only live it by the power of the Holy Spirit. He cannot live or reproduce the life of Jesus by and within himself. The Holy Spirit must reproduce our Lord. Just as he brought Christ into the world, the Holy Spirit brings Christ into your heart. And just as Jesus Christ, the man, had to be born, you have to be born. You have to be born again. Born by the same Holy Spirit. About a new dimension. Now, the person of the Holy Spirit is always there. But over in uh, St. John chapter 7, he said, Those that really thirst and believe in me, out of their belly will flow rivers of living water which spake he of the Holy Ghost, which had not yet been given, because Christ was not yet glorified. That is to say, while Jesus Christ was in his human flesh on the earth, in the visible, physical form, there was a certain dimension of the Holy Spirit that was working. And a certain dimension of the Holy Spirit was not yet given at that time. And it was first given at the day of Pentecost, in the second chapter, and we see the pattern that the Holy Spirit came upon them in order that they might have power from on high. Not only power from the earth, 
but power from on high, heavenly power, supernatural power, that they would be transformed and become witnesses of our Lord with a new dimension of power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit and also an ability from within through which they express their inner man in tongues, a new tongue. It was an opening up of the inner man from a deeper level within themselves. They all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. It was a beginning of tongues. It was not an ending of tongues. They began to speak with other tongues, suggesting a lifelong experience. And then we turn over to 1 Corinthians 14 and we learn what those tongues are. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. That's 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. That is to say, it is not a horizontal experience. It is not man to man. It is vertical. It is man to God. It is coming out of the, the belly or the inner man, the rivers flooding up, and the Holy Ghost. Producing a new kind of communication. And then it's most uh, interesting to us today, in this so-called sophisticated intellectual age, in 1 Corinthians 14 and 14, Paul is saying, I'll pray with the Spirit and I'll pray with the understanding also. I'll sing with the Spirit or praise. I'll praise God with the Spirit and I'll praise God with the intellect also. He is saying something to us. That in addition to the human language stored up in the intellect, there is another language stored up in the spirit of man who has been saved, who has been born again, who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are two, actually two levels of communication with God on a personal basis. Prayer or praise, as we conceive the words by our mind, coming up out of our heart. And secondly, prayer praise coming up out of the heart itself, coming up out of the spirit, not coming through the intellect at all. But the beautiful part in that connection is 1 Corinthians 14 and 13. He that speaks an unknown tongue, let him pray that he may interpret. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you've got to do two things. And I've never seen anyone able to speak in tongues who doesn't do these two things. First, you've got to stop speaking in your own language for the moment. You have to stop it. You simply stop praying or praising in English or whatever language that uh, you know and that you speak with, you're familiar with. You just momentarily stop. And secondly, you have to open your mouth. You have to open your mouth. I think right here, more sincere Christian people break down and feel that they cannot have the ability to pray in tongues or praise God in tongues, for they are waiting for God to do it. And God has no need of speaking in tongues himself. Jesus Christ has no need of speaking in time because he and his father are absolutely one. He had the, the ability to communicate with God perfectly from within, which you and I do not have. For in Romans chapter 8, it very expressly says, we know not how we should pray as we ought. Now you can't say that about Jesus Christ. You cannot say he doesn't know how to pray as he ought. We know not how to pray as we ought. I'm the first to say that I don't know how, and I'm sure you'd be the first to say you don't know how. Tongues are for people who have believed on our Lord, but who have been accustomed through their lifetime of thinking through their intellect. Thinking through their intellect, speaking through their intellect, learning through their intellect, living in their intellect, which is right and proper. But the fact of the matter is, we are far more than intellectual or physical beings. We are, first of all, and primarily, spiritual beings. 
I mean, we're spirit made in the image of God with a mind and a body attached to us. The real you is the spirit. Well, now, there's a language stored up down there. He that believeth on me, Christ said in John 7, out of his innermost being shall flood up or flow rivers of living water, which spake he of the Holy Ghost. How do you know that happens? Well, you have felt the Spirit of God coming up within you. I've never talked to any Christian who said it hadn't happened to him. I don't mean that he would use the language I'm using because each one says it his own way. But each of us is conscious of something coming up, something good. And we who understand it, at least understand it to some extent, know it is the Spirit of God, like rivers, flooding up. That's the language. That's the Spirit coming up, trying to speak through you. But you have to speak the words. You have to open your mouth. God isn't going to pump it into you and make But in order for this baptism of the Holy Spirit to be released within you, you have to stop your own speech momentarily and open your mouth. And start to speak. Speak what? As the Spirit gives you utterance. I prayed with countless numbers of people throughout the years. And those who had believed on our Lord, having repented of their sins and taken Christ into their hearts, I've never seen one yet fail. If he would just stop speaking his own tongue for a moment and open his mouth, The Holy Spirit gives utterance. He gives his own language. And what is that language? First of all, you don't understand it. Then what good is it? The good of it is, it gets beyond your understanding, down here where your spirit is, where where the deepest part of you lives, and through that language coming up, You're saying what you wish you could say through your mind and don't know how. And you're edifying yourself. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 14. He that speaketh in tongues edified himself. It's a very personal, subjective experience. It's for prayer and for praise in your personal life. That is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As far as I'm concerned, as I understand the Bible, it's for everybody. I've never seen anybody fail to receive it, at least who I worked with. If they'll just open up and just take those simple little steps, the Holy Spirit will give the utterance. But now there's a gift of tongues that is distinct from the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the tongue that comes with that experience. They're two different things. But let me proceed again, and then we'll wind up talking about the gift of tongues. Notice in the second chapter of Acts, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there was no laying on of hands, although we'll see it happening in another place or two, that hands were laid on. These were followers of Jesus, including Mary, his own mother. And you'll read her name in the first uh, chapter of Acts, as they tell about who is there. The apostles are there, and about 120. So the Holy Spirit just met them where they were in their relationship with God and filled them. Uh, in that second chapter, the 38th verse, in the sermon that Peter gave on that day, which by the way was in his own language, he didn't try to preach in tongues, he didn't try to teach in tongues, because that's not the purpose of tongues. The purpose of tongues is always intercessory. You're interceding for yourself or you're interceding for someone else. So you don't teach or preach in tongues. But in that third verse, he was asked what they must do. These onlookers who had come to see and observe and who wanted to be saved, he said, to repent. To repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise of the Holy Ghost is unto you and to your children. And to them who are far off, that means Gentiles, or to as many as the Lord our God shall call. The baptism of the Holy Spirit with the accompanying tongues through which you pray through your spirit is available to every child of God. But the gift of tongues is not available 
not available as a ministry gift to everyone. The moment we, we get outside our personal selves, and one of the gifts of the Spirit, such as tongues, is manifested through us, we now have a ministry gift. And not everybody gets the same ministry gift. As I said, I'll get to that. Turn over to Acts chapter 8. That's the second example. Philip, who was filled with the Holy Ghost, went down to Samaria. Samaria had the people who were half Jews and half Gentiles. They were a mixed breed. And there he preaches Christ to them. And demons come out of people. Sicknesses are healed. Many miracles are done to the name of the Lord Jesus. And great joy is in that city. And right in the midst of it, the leading occultist, Simon, came up and professed to believe in Jesus Christ. He really hadn't, but he professed to. He was a sorcerer. He was dealing in witchcraft and black magic and, and things of that nature. And if you read that eighth chapter of Acts, you'll find that he just had that whole town upon his hands. He had deceived them. And they thought he was a great man of God. They did not realize he was influenced by a demon. But when Philip came preaching Jesus Christ, these people were delivered from occultism, from witchcraft and things of that nature. And Simon himself, the leader, professed in that revival to be converted. Philip did a real great job. But that was as far as he could go. Then Peter and John came down from Jerusalem to look things over. And when they got down there, two things took place. Number one, as they examined these new converts to Jesus Christ, they wanted to know had they received the Holy Ghost. Had they been filled with the Spirit? And they said, no, they had not. So, the Holy Spirit meets them right at the point where they are. And I'll keep saying that phrase because... After a while, you will see exactly what I mean by it in your life, that the Holy Spirit meets you where you are, where you are. And so they laid hands on these new Christians, Peter and John did, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, hands were laid on in the 8th chapter of Acts, but they were not laid on in the 2nd chapter, which is saying that there's a variety of methods which God may use to baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Then the second thing they did was to deal with the Simon, the occultist, who claimed to be converted, because he walked up and saw what Peter and John were doing, and he saw that through the laying on of their hands, these people received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it does not say that they spoke in tongues in the 8th chapter of Acts. In all the Bible commentaries I've read, they agree that they did. I believe they did, but it does not say it. And I want to stress the fact it does not come out overtly and say it. But there was something about their receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit that was obvious to this occultist, Simon. And he offered them money. He said, I'll, I'll just give you a lot of money if you let me have this so that when I lay my hands on people they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and Peter looked at him and called him some unnice names you devil you <laughs> and then he meant what are you saying too and he told him the kind of fact he read his pedigree and it uh, didn't go back to God it went back to the devil and uh, he told him he was going to perish with his money and he said, repent and get right with God. And the man then pled with him, with Peter and with John, to pray for him that none of these things would fall on him. It was a powerful experience. The point I'm emphasizing is that they were met at the point where they were. The third one is Acts 9. Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, when he was converted... Through the conversion experience, Ananias laid his hands upon him. Ananias was a layman and uh, over there in the city of Damascus. And the Holy Spirit gave him a vision of Saul of Tarsus, of Saul of Tarsus being in the city and having his heart touched by God. 
At first he was frightened because Saul was killing many Christians and was coming to Damascus to kill the Christians there. But the Holy Spirit bade him to go over. And he walked in and said, Brother Saul, I've come to lay hands on you and pray for you that you might receive your sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now again, there was the laying on of hands. Again, it does not mention that Saul of Tarsus prayed in tongues or spoke in tongues at that moment. We only know in 1 Corinthians 14, which is Paul's own autobiographical experience of his tongue speaking, that he did later, if not then, start speaking in tongues. Again, I want to point out the variety of methods that God uses, and you cannot simply say, this is the way he does it, this one way and no more. Because God uses many varieties. He used the laying on of Ananias' hands on Saul of Tarsus. He does not say when Saul of Tarsus began to speak in tongues. He may have that moment. Maybe not. It doesn't say. But we know he did. And I keep saying to people, quit worrying about how, just so you do. <laughs> just so you come into the experience. We're not worried about how my denomination emphasizes it or how your denomination emphasizes it or does not emphasize it. We're concerned about individual receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit as God may direct. And you coming into the experience as God will lead you. Remember last semester our Dr. Frost said that God is sovereign and unique and since he made you in his own image, he makes you sovereign and unique and you're different from anybody else. Because you are you. And so he's going to deal with you the way he chooses to deal with you. The next is Acts chapter 10. The soldiers at Caesarea, the house of Cornelius, these were Roman soldiers who had worshipped God, but knew little or nothing about Christ having come. But Cornelius is so devoted to God, his giving has come up before God as memorial, and God sends down an angel and says, Go for Simon Peter. And they bring Peter, and Peter begins to preach to them. In fact, it's a great lesson. It's a great lesson in racial understanding because the Jews just didn't have anything to do with the Romans. The Romans were in the same spot in many ways that the black man is in our white society today. But Peter went down there, and the Spirit began to speak to him that God is of no respect of persons. He does not respect the person at all. He loves everybody. And he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. This is after Peter received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He still was prejudiced. He still had race prejudice. You know, it's funny how this has got around that when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, suddenly you're super spiritual, you're super holy, you're super perfect. And I want to tell you, you're the same old human being, same human being, you're not an angel, you, you've not been made perfect, and you'll be making mistakes until the day you die, you'll be having prejudices and biases. It's not the fault of the Holy Spirit you're like that, or I'm like that. It's just that we're human beings and we're stubborn and we get biases and prejudices and make them so important that we live by them. But finally the Holy Spirit got inside a man that he'd baptized in the Holy Spirit and showed him that he shouldn't have respect to persons. And while he was preaching, he made a statement about, about repenting and believing on Jesus for the remission of sins and the Holy Ghost fell on all that heard that word. I mean, Peter didn't lay his hands on him or anything. Just while he was speaking, down came the Holy Spirit and baptized them. And they all began to speak with tongues. And say, when Peter got back up to Jerusalem to report this, he was excited about it. But the Jewish elders, all of whom had been baptized with the Holy Spirit, didn't like it. Because they didn't think a Jew should go into Gentiles, have any dealings with them. Certainly not on a spiritual basis. And he recounted to them how they had received the same baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues as they had on the day of Pentecost. And the elders, excuse the expression, just pulled their horns in and began to rejoice and praise God. And that ended the racial discrimination 
problem in the early church. I've said all along, you get people baptized with the Holy Spirit and praying from the inner man, it will do more to solve the race problem than anything we can do. But it won't solve it automatically. It won't solve it just because you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. You've got to listen to God. You've got to respond to these feelings you get about human beings. And you quit looking at people because they're white or red or yellow or, or brown or black or shades between. You don't think of them like that because we're all made of one blood. Will you say amen to that? Amen. Okay. Now the last example, the fifth, is in the 19th chapter. Paul comes down to Ephesus. And there he finds a small group of men, maybe a dozen, who are disciples, who have believed on Jesus through the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, let me reemphasize what I've just said. In the 19th chapter, he findeth these men, and he says, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, We have not so much as heard there be any Holy Ghost. For well, they had been baptized into John's baptism. What this means is that now, many years after the day of Pentecost, Paul finds a group of people who believed in Jesus, who started it way back there before the day of Pentecost, while John the Baptist was alive. And John the Baptist had told them of the coming Christ of how Jesus was coming. And they believed it. But they had not known it anymore, or at least not much more than that. That is, they believed all they had been taught. And now Peter finds them, and the Bible says he lays his hands on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues and prophesy. Notice that the Holy Spirit met them where they were. I'm trying to say that theologically or doctrinally, you cannot build a doctrine based on this Bible and say there's one method by which you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it because God is going to meet you where you are. That is to say, first of all, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ repenting of your sins. And from that moment on, you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The very moment that you accept Jesus Christ is the best time to do it. There's no doubt about that. But if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't stop talking in your own tongue for a moment and open your mouth, it probably will never happen. And you know, that's a real tragedy. How willing we are to open our mouths on other good things and keep it shut when it comes to speaking in the Spirit. Is it because we are frightened that if we relinquish the intellect for a moment and get down here into the real us, the real spirit of ourselves, we're frightened that... uh, Something bad is going to happen. Is it we're afraid that the stored up language in the inner man is something that we should never express to God? Or is it what I think it is? Just simply lack of teaching. Lack of teaching. And people always ask me, why haven't we been taught? Well, I wish I could answer that. I wish they'd have taught me earlier, but they didn't. That's what I'm up here for, trying to teach a little bit. And I certainly can't say that I've reached it all. I know there's much more out there, but I can certainly share what I know. And what I'm saying, I do know. Paul was very, very concerned about these Christians who believed in Jesus through John's baptism. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? We're very concerned about every Christian opening up. If you have missed this gift when you were saved, at that time you could have. Why? Because when you accept Christ, you receive the person of the Holy Spirit. 
And you can very scripturally, honestly say, yes, I'm a Christian. I have the Holy Spirit. Because you do. But you may or may not have a baptism in the Holy Spirit. You may not have this dimension of the Holy Spirit our Lord's talking about in these five examples in the book of Acts, by which you open up the inner man and the Spirit gives you utterance in prayer and praise that it comes out of your inner man. And while it's not a cure-all, I can tell you personally it's the most soul-satisfying experience I've ever known. And until you receive it, you probably won't be able to understand what I'm saying. And yet the moment you receive it, the understanding will come because you will experience what I'm talking about. You'll edify yourself. You'll strengthen yourself in the inner man. You'll empty out many of the things down there which through the intellect are not being emptied out. You'll feel a freedom within. And you'll feel a blossoming of your intellect to where if you just stop a moment and pray, ask God to give you the interpretation of what you said in tongues, you can interpret your own new tongue. And then you can pray in English, you pray in your own language, and you can pray a lot more effectively. You see, you have two levels of communication, two wavelengths, one of the intellect and one of the spirit. One is uh, through your own language and one is through the language th that you have, uh, that the spirit gives you utterance to say. Okay, from there we go over to 1 Corinthians 12 and we notice where that he talks about the gifts of the spirit. We have now a reference to the gift of tongues. I do pray the Holy Spirit will help me to say this in the scriptural way and will help you to grasp it. Heretofore, before this, before he talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, among them the gift of tongues. The Lord is talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Or the infilling with the Holy Spirit. It's all the same thing. And by which you edify yourself through tongues. That is not a gift of tongues. I know so many people today who had no background of understanding on it, who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and are now speaking in tongues, think they have the gift of tongues. I can understand why that someone might think that. He's never been taught it. And because they think they have the gift of tongues, then you really give the enemy a position against the whole charismatic movement. Why? All right, I'll just read it to you in 1 Corinthians 12, and you'll see yourself here why there has been so much confusion. Let's start reading at verse 8, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. I'll wait for you to turn there. I want you to read out loud with me. Read out loud with me, 1 Corinthians 12. Let's read verse 1 together. Now concerning spiritual gifts... I would not have you ignorant or, or uninformed. Now let's start down to where he talks about them, beginning verse 7. Ready? But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, divers kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work up that one and the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now hold right there. And let's read verses 30 and 31 together. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? 
He doesn't say yes or no, but the emphasis or the inference is no. Read that next verse. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And then he starts the 13th chapter on divine love. Let me show you how you play right into the hands of the enemy of the charismatic power. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and through it a release of your inner man through tongues, which is for yourself, for your private devotions, to edify your own self. That's what it's for. When you receive that, and you call it a gift of tongues, then you're getting over here in the nine gifts, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, gift of faith, gift of healing, gift of miracles, gift of discerning of spirits, gift of prophecy, gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, And I'll discuss with you beginning next week. These nine gifts are not chosen by you. God divides them as he wills. You can't go up and say, God, I want a gift of healing or I want a gift of tongues. God's going to decide that. Why? Because he compares the gifts of the Spirit to the different members of your body. Why does he do that? Because the church is a body of many believers. They're short and tall and fat and thin and old and young and rich and poor and all different races. They're different. But they all have Christ. They all have the Holy Spirit. But just as all of my members are not hands, so that one person out here doesn't necessarily have all the gifts of the Spirit. That may not be your ministering gift at all. So, in the church, do all manifest a gift of tongues? The inference is no. Now, right there is where people say a gift of tongues is not the evidence of the baptism. That you don't have to speak in tongues to have the baptism. You can see where they're confused. They're right and they're wrong. It is true the gift of tongues is not the evidence of having received the baptism. It is not true that when you receive the baptism, you can't speak in tongues. They're right and they're wrong. So they're all waiting around for God to give the gift of tongues. And strangely enough, in most churches you don't have it. Because they're waiting around for God, if it is an evidence, for God to give it. He isn't going to do it. Now, the big problem at Corinth, among the Christians and Corinth, was right here. When the nine gifts of the Spirit were manifested among the Christians in Corinth, they began to decide which one they wanted. It's exactly like my right eye saying, I am the number one thing in Oral Roberts' body, so I'm going to be the big eye. (laughs) And suddenly my eye covers my face and my body, and all you see is my eye. What they were saying, the gift of tongues is more sensational than some of these other gifts, so I want a gift of tongues. I can get more attention if I'll stand up and speak in this language that people can't understand. They will really think I'm a super, super spiritual person. And they became jealous of one another. Then Paul begins to talk about the members of your body. There are some members of your body that you keep covered Paul says, are they any less important because you cover them up? He's saying there are a variety of gifts. A word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, gift of miracles, gift of healing, gift of faith, gift of tongues. They're all in the body of Christ. And he'll manifest one to this woman or this man, one to this man or this woman. And they have a ministry gift. That is, they have access to this gift. And through them, the Spirit manifests it to meet somebody's need. It's absolutely true. Exactly the way Paul said it. Do they all have the gifts of healing? No. Then he says, covet the best gifts. Does that mean to say that some are not good? That some are better than others? Are you going to say that your hand is better than your foot? Your ear is better than your eye? No, that isn't what he means at all. 
yet show I unto you a more excellent way, which is love. And immediately, people that don't understand the charismatic movement say, you take the gift of tongues, I'll take love. But love is not a substitute for a gift of the Spirit. Love is not a replacement for a gift of the Spirit. Any more than a train is a substitute for the track. Or a car is a substitute for a road. Paul is saying the Spirit is going to manifest a gift, but you must also manifest love. Because if you don't really love, then what good is a gift of the Spirit in your life? How can you really help anybody, even if you have a gift of healing, or if you have a gift of tongues, if you don't have love causing you to use it? He says you could have all the money and give it and wouldn't be a profitable thing. You could even have your body burned up. If you didn't have love, you were nothing. Okay, one more thought. And that's the 14th chapter. And you'll notice how the gifts and love are linked together forever. 1 Corinthians 14.1. Read with me, please. Follow after charity or love and desire spiritual gifts. Now hold it right there. He says the pursuit of your life is not running around saying, God, give me four or five of these gifts. The pursuit of your life is how to love. And then he said, desire spiritual gifts. In your heart, desire that God will manifest one or more of these gifts through you. That through the love you have, you can really help people. Now, does that make any sense to anybody? If so, hold up your right hand. If it doesn't, hold up your left hand. And I'll come at it another way. Okay, I got one on that. That's all right. I had a good average, didn't I? I'd like for you to welcome Mrs. Ken Tricky. Mrs. Peggy Tricky, I'm sorry. Peggy, come on over here and sit down. Would you give Peggy a nice hand tonight? Uh, and Miss Jackie Fuquay, would you welcome Jackie Fuquay? And will you welcome my darling wife, Evelyn? And will you welcome Reverend Bill Sanders? There he is. Will you all be seated, please? Thank you. Would you go ahead and be seated? Reverend Bill Sanders. I wish I had a red suit like that. I gave my old one to the uh, Salvation Army of Seed Faith, and this is what I got. <laughs> thing I was going to say, if I had a red suit like that, my wife wouldn't let me wear it in public. Uh, <laughs> but you're being younger and handsomer and more Indian than I am. I'm almost getting in the spirit of the Corinthian church of envy towards you because you're so young and handsome. Above all, you're more Indian. I'm one-eighth Indian and you look half. Don't tell me how much because I'm complimenting you whether you know it or not. I know it. Uh, yeah, all right. I'm Cherokee too. You're a Cherokee too. Now you're bragging and you're getting into that Corinthian spirit there by, <laughs> by bragging. <laughs> and Jackie has been out in the sun too long. I declare, Jackie. Go ahead and laugh. It's all right. Isn't it, Jackie? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jackie is really beautiful. Be beautiful outside and inside. And Peggy, Peggy Tricky, your husband coaches basketball somewhere, doesn't he? Can pull that over there to you so we can all hear you. Doesn't he coach uh, basketball somewhere? All the time. All the time, somewhere. <laughs> all right. Peggy, I hope you're scared. Not. <laughs> you don't have stage fright? Not as much as I thought I would, no. Well, I tell you, it's pretty tough to get up in front of a crowd, uh, even when you're used to it. I get butterflies. Jackie, are you are you scared? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> uh, Bill, always. Yeah. Evelyn, sure, I'm scared to death every time I get up here. What are you scared of? I don't know, unless it's the devil. Honey, <laughs> <laughs> you're not referring specifically to anyone near you, are you? <laughs> Well, I tell you, when I get you by my side on the panel, I don't know exactly what to expect, except I'm going to get it. <laughs> Real nice to have you, oh, Evelyn and Jackie Thank and you. Bill and Peggy. And I, I chose this panel for the variety of experience they have had. 
because of the variety of experience of the Holy Spirit and particularly the gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12. Evelyn and I have had the baptism of the Holy Spirit for a great many years and some of the gifts will work through us at times, sometimes they don't. Jackie has been a Christian for several years. She's from the Baptist faith, but she's had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I guess, four months maybe? Right. Four months. Bill was a Baptist pastor right here in town and received the gift of the Holy Spirit maybe five years ago. <clears throat> That's right. Right. And uh, Peggy is, aren't you of a Baptist background too? Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist. <laughs> You're the Doug Manning of a Brother Doug's church. He really has a great church and he's a great man of God. And we chose Peggy because she is not experienced in this type of thing until recently and may represent many people in the audience who have questions to ask. I was hoping that she might express some things that may be hard to understand or doesn't reflect her background or something of that nature. But let's start with Evelyn and we'll start with a comment, Evelyn, on something that stands out to you that I might have said or might have been revealed to you by the Spirit while I was speaking. Yes, I was most interested in what you said about Romans 1.11. I don't remember I right now. I long to yes, see you that right. I may impart some gift unto you. This was the first time that I ever saw that Paul actually felt the needs of these people. I always thought, well, he wanted to be with them just like we want to be with our Christian friends for fellowship and so on, but I had no idea that he actually felt the needs of these people in Rome. But I can see how he did, because he wanted a gift to be manifested through him for them, right? which is what the gifts are actually for, so it, it makes sense. All right, take this, Evelyn, we, the man that delivers milk to us, do you know that we usually call him the milkman? And he isn't a milkman, is he? No, he's not made out of milk. <laughs> he, he delivers milk. Right. Don't you see uh, what we're saying here? That when a gift of healing, a gift of tongues may be manifested in you, that's really not yours or you or for your sake. That's for the sake of someone else. Just like the milkman brings the milk for your children, for your family, and he goes on. Mm -hmm. He delivers it. And you would deliver this gift. Paul is saying, I want to get there and deliver to you these gifts of God that will meet needs in your life. That's what Paul is saying. In is, the that way why, that, is that why you're so need conscious yourself? I am very need conscious, Evelyn, because I met Christ through my needs. And everybody I've ever dealt with has had a need. I mean, everybody has needs and problems. And the time you get one met, there's another one. Have you ever noticed that? You get one problem solved, here comes his brother or his sister or his uncle or his grandma or somebody. You always have these needs. And our Lord loves us. Now, Jackie, would you express what stands out in your mind, what I may have said or what might have come to your mind? Well, I listened when you were talking about the Spirit not actually making us perfect. But the Spirit helps us over our faults. It shows us, in a way, when we're wrong and how we're doing wrong. And I think that this is just something really great because I can see this working in my life this way. When you received the Holy Spirit as a gift, as a baptism, over four or five months ago, you spoke in tongues several times, and there was a period after you did that you couldn't, right. and that worried you. It came back. And now you've found through this experience that it didn't make you perfect. True. You still make mistakes. You have faults. Do you get discouraged at times? Oh, if I get discouraged, I'll say a little prayer. And then my spirit is lifted. I depend on the Lord to bring me over my lowness. Okay. Uh, are you saying, too, that you have or have not come into some super spirituality, but you're the same individual? Right. Uh, I say that myself. I'm the same person, but I have more help now. I have more help to help me. Now, Peggy, uh, we were talking with you the other day and some others along the same line, how the idea has grown in people's minds, and if you ever receive this, suddenly you're some other kind of human being. And people look at them, and they see them make mistakes, and they say, well, there's nothing to it. Uh, Remember, we, we, we were talking about that. What comment would you have to say on that and or something else I may have indicated? Well, as I told you, I really didn't know before that there was a difference in 
devotional tongues and the gift of tongues. And that's where I was really, really confused because I didn't know there was a difference. And uh, there is a vast difference. And there's a more unique quality of God in the gift of tongues than is in devotional tongues. And this makes a difference. And I like what you said tonight, too, about uh, God dealing with us uniquely and different methods according to where we are. I like that real well. And don't you see here that with all of our denominations, and I never met one that I couldn't see a lot of good in, but with all of our denominations, we fall into one big error, and that is to say you've got to be just like us or you may not make it in. I, oh, I don't think we say that so much as it's sort of... sort of. No, we imp- really say it. Oh, we really say it, do we, huh? Yeah, we really do. Uh, it's sad, but we do. And here we find that our Lord has a variety of ways he manifests himself because his concern is not to prove a point. His concern is you. His concern is me. All right, now Peggy, in your own mind, what would you say one or two of the differences might be between the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brings the devotional tongue and a gift of tongues itself. Well, as I understand it from what you said the other day and tonight that devotional tongues is something you really have to originate on your own. You have to begin it. You have to start it. You can't wait for something to hit you. You have to do it yourself. And whereas a gift of tongues, this would be something special and unique and divine from God, a truly mystical kind of unique experience that's right and we're going to get into that in real depth next Tuesday night that's why I want you all to read 1 Corinthians 12 and I mean pay attention to the chapter Bill Sanders what stands out in your mind several things um, Brother Oral Roberts but okay, one Brother thing one thing especially and that is you said that the Holy Spirit reproduces the life of Jesus Christ in us yes and that the work of the Holy Spirit was to bring the full empowerment of the ministry of Jesus Christ right here in the now, in us. So that the definition of the church is not really the one I learned in seminary, you know, to meet all of our denominational specifications. But I think the definition of the church then would be that it's just a continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ because we are his body. You're getting me excited, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> we are his body. I'm like and so preaching. Jesus... Pardon? I'm glad we start preaching if you keep going like that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> you better not turn up preaching me. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> so, uh, what makes it so exciting is that it makes sense when Jesus said, the things that I do, you will do. As a matter of fact, he expects us to do it because we have his life in us. And so the church today is a continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ. We ought to be doing right now what Jesus Christ would do if he would come right here in the flesh. Now that's what, when you said, the Holy Spirit reproduces the life of Jesus Christ. Man, that's great. Let's see if you said what I think you said. Okay. <laughs> that Jesus Christ had a body when he was on earth. Yes. I mean, he had to have a body. And it was a body of flesh. Now that he's gone away, he has to have a body. And he's still a flesh, a body of flesh. Amen. We are that body in the flesh. We are the Word made flesh just like he was. And so, through the Holy Spirit, He's in me and He's in you, and all these nine gifts are just that much of Jesus in us, right. in the now, and we just can't hardly wait to get out there and go. Praise the Lord. Is this what you said? Yeah, I guess so. I thought that's exactly <laughs> what you said. There's one other thing that you oh, said I thought was real great. A lot of things, but one of it I marked down here. We have a lack of knowledge because, probably because of a lack of teaching. Oh, yes. A lack of teaching. And what a thrill it is to see this many people get exposure. And I praise God for people whose hearts have been opened by the Holy Spirit to get exposure in prayer groups, in things that go on out here like that. 
the people perish because of a lack of knowledge. You know, I'm amazed that uh, the late J. Arthur Rank, Lord Rank in England, who was a Methodist layman and who came of the Holy Spirit through my ministry, had a vision of an academic chair at Oral Roberts University, right. an academic chair on the Holy Spirit, and, and that I would be the first teacher of it. There will be other teachers. There he was in England. We were talking about this four or five years ago. He's now in heaven, and he made the gift to start the academic chair. I didn't know who would enroll. I expected at the most 500 to enroll last fall, and we had about 1,200. This uh, spring we'll have about 1,400. I had no idea that many people would be interested in this. And what do you think is happening throughout our city of Tulsa in the charismatic right now? Not only through this, but through you and others throughout the city. What's going on, Bill? People are hungry and thirsty. And the Bible says that if you're hungry, that you'll be filled. Yes. And so people are throwing off all restraints as far as, well, here I am, a Baptist or a Methodist or what have you. That second place, first place, is Jesus Christ. First Jesus Christ is taking first place in this city, and people are searching and they're being filled. You just said something important. Doctor, Jim Winslow, are you up there anywhere? Run down here right quick, would you please? Uh, you said something the other day that you've got to repeat. Dr. Jim Winslow is an orthopedic surgeon here in the city and a layman in one of our local churches received the baptism. While you're coming, try to f figure out how long you've had the baptism with the Holy Spirit now. It's been several weeks, and I'm going to ask you a question about how that you said you were first something and then secondly you were... Come over here by me, uh, if you will, Jim. Hi. Everybody give a nice uh, welcome to my buddy Jim. How long has it been now that you've had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Four months, two weeks, and three days. Uh, okay. Now, you remember when you first began to speak in tongues? Yes. You had to stop speaking in English? Yes or no? That's correct. Did you have to open your mouth? Yes. I'm giving these the questions, aren't I? <laughs> I can answer those. Yeah. But now, you went back to your church, which you love and in which you've been reared all your life, and you made a statement to them, and you repeated the statement to me. Along the line we're talking about, I'm something first and I'm something else second. Do you think it's okay to say that publicly? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I said I was a Christian first and a Methodist second. What did you mean by that? Well, that I belonged to Jesus Christ first and that I attended the Methodist church rather than me saying I am a Methodist, I am a Christian. I happen to go to the Methodist church. Well, are you uh, trying to put the Methodist church down? No, I'm trying to build it up. <laughs> All right, now, Jim, can you respond or react to anything in the panel has said, beginning with Peggy Tricky over here or anyone on the panel? Anything stand out in your mind of what they may have said? I thought what Bill Sanders said just now really impressed me that the people in this community are uh, opening their hearts to Christ uh, through the efforts of uh, this school, through Bill Sanders' ministry, and a lot of other people who are, are working in this community to try to teach. And through churches, too. That's right, through churches. That's all. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off that easy. <laughs> I thought I'd succeeded. <laughs> Him a question about something you said tonight. See if he'll agree to this. <laughs> You've already asked it for me. Why should I ask? No, it? no. I want to ask him a specific question. Okay. Jim Oral said that in receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there are two things that happen to us. One, we have ability from within and power from on high. Was this true in your experience? What do you mean by ability from within? Well, I, now he said this. The ability I didn't. within to speak. And to communicate with God on a, on a deeper level. That's what I meant by that, the language of prayer and praise. Secondly, power from on high. You're asking him or me now. Does it take both? Keep talking. Well, you sure feel both. Uh, there's no doubt And anyone who's sitting up there who's been baptized with the Holy Spirit and has prayed in tongues is aware of the power that you feel come over you from on high. 
they also will immediately become aware of the fact that you recognize that you can now really pray instead of just converse with God, which is what I, I'm afraid most of us do when we pray in English. It's sort of a one-way conversation, uh, mainly one way because we won't hush long enough. If God wanted to say anything, we couldn't hear him. But when you pray in tongues, you recognize from within that you really are communicating with God rather than just talking to him. Very good. Very good. I just wanted to verify what he said. Peggy, you have you a have your seat back. Hold it just a minute now. Peggy, this has become a new experience beginning in your life. you have a question to ask one who's had it for about four months? No, I've heard Jim before. He's real clear. I like what he said. Jackie? I'd just like to ask him if he felt like I did. When I was at home in my church, I always felt like I had the Holy Spirit. But now since I received this ability to speak in tongues, I feel closer. I feel that I've got more now. Do you feel this too? Yes. I really didn't know much about the Holy Spirit up until the last year or so ago. It was the last thing in the doxology. And, uh, you know, if you're down at St. John's Hospital at 8.30 at night, you hear the priest give the final blessing for the evening, and that's the last thing he says, is the Holy Spirit. Those were words before, but they're something that I feel within now. I really hadn't been exposed to very much. I, I really can't say that I felt the Holy Spirit's power before because... Well, I shouldn't say that. I may have felt the power, but I didn't recognize what it was. Didn't, didn't you tell me, Doctor, that it was a group of doctors' wives who had gotten together, been baptized with the Spirit, and now their husbands suddenly becoming aware of the Holy Spirit, more or less, through these prayer groups? They're making progress. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Well, Bill Sanders, you feel anything else coming off, uh, hot off the wire? I liked what you said, that God is a God of variety. A variety. We can't put him in a box and say, God, you've got to do it the assembly way, or the Baptist way, or the, or the Catholic way, or the interdenominational way, or the Pentecostal way, Amen. or the Nazarene way. Yes. Or the Episcopal way. That's right. Or the United Brethren way. <laughs> or the... You've got 800 Christ more to go. Way. You've got 800 more? Oh, I have 800 more to go. I'll never make it tonight. But go ahead, will you? Because um, about the time we say, God, you've got to do it this way, God says, no, I'm not going to do it that way. We've got to be open. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He opens us up so that we can can hear what God's doing right now. I heard you say something once that, that I liked. This was a long time ago. You said, I want to find out what God's doing and get right in the middle of it. Now, the way you find out what God's doing is through the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. You know what you're saying to me? This is, so. Let me see if this is what you're saying. Through the Holy Spirit, there's a continuing revelation That's right. of our Lord. It's an open-ended affair. It's not a closed affair. Something happened one time and one time only. It's a continuation through the Holy Spirit. Our Lord is alive in every moment, and it's always the now with Amen. God. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we begin this journey of becoming in the image of Christ. When we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that is, as you expressed, a new dimension. Mm -hmm. And without this new dimension, we cannot manifest the life of Christ. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we cannot manifest the life of Christ in power because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for empowerment for ministry. Right? I've got problems right here, Bill. Shall well, I bring I, them up? Can I help you? <laughs> You just might be able to. Let's see here now. I don't have any problem if you let me restate what you're saying, and if I restate it the way you meant it. 
you said when we receive the Holy Spirit, you're saying by that when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit himself, the person, comes in. I don't think that was made clear. Then you went to the second point, the baptism in the Spirit, which is a new dimension. Right. Now you said, through this new dimension of the power, that's when you come in the fullness of the power. I believe you said that. That's just more of the life of Jesus Christ more of Jesus. in me. Because okay, I, I, have didn't, no problem. I didn't pray in the Spirit before I'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd never manifested many of the gifts before I'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And to me, that's more of Jesus. Yes, you probably had manifested some of the gifts yeah, before you ever spoke in tongues. Right, that's right. I know men who don't speak in tongues who are tremendous men and women of God. They don't have this deeper level of prayer, but I haven't met one yet who, if you talk to them privately and they can open up, but that they're interested. Peggy, mm -hmm. you look like you're ready to say something. I'm just thinking that a lot of misunderstanding, I think, comes from two things, vocabulary and recognition. Mm -hmm. Now explain them. Well, if we say a word, everybody in here has a different wheel going around in their head for that one word. It's true. And uh, I think that hinders us some. And the more talking we do and the more discussion we do, the more it's cleared up. And also recognition of what is God's Spirit. Sometimes we fail, just like Jim said. He, he said Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost and really never thought about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many times we fail to recognize what is there because mm. we're simply not educated. Well, I sense right now the Spirit is here and let's all join hands. And each of us pray in our own way one for another and for ourselves. Those of us who have experienced this baptism of the Holy Spirit, to pray we'll better understand it. And those who have not received this new dimension of power to open up to it. Father, help us that we will open up to the blessed Holy Spirit who will bring us more of Jesus Christ in the now, to meet our needs, and above all, to help us be an instrument to meet the needs of other people, and to lead them to Christ, and to deeper dimensions of Christ, and bless everyone in this room, and whom they represent, their families, their children, their loved ones, their dear ones. We pray through Christ our Lord. We believe, and we expect many miracles, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.